Hello, welcome back to Cracking the Cryptic, where as usual on uh, weekends we tend to take a look at the previous Friday's diabolical Sudoku, which appears in the Daily Telegraph each week here in the UK. Uh, this is uh, by far the hardest uh, regular Sudoku that is published in the broadsheet press, uh, in my opinion, um, and I, actually I would really welcome feedback if uh, any of the viewers of the channel know of a regularly published, generally available, hard Sudoku puzzle. Um, so this is a lot harder, for example, than the hard New York Times puzzle. It's a lot harder than the super fiendish puzzle, which appears in the Times. Um, and it's always an interesting challenge. Now, what you can see on the screen here is uh, the black numbers showing the puzzle as originally presented in the paper, and the blue numbers are uh, the sort of in instantly gettable numbers without using any advanced techniques just by scanning the rows and columns eliminating the obvious candidates you can you can reach this point very straightforwardly and the only I suppose mildly interesting thing to notice is one seven pair over here um, and so this is the point you can get to without using anything clever and now we have the job of spotting something clever now I'm going to talk about two techniques that you can use to make progress from here. One of which is, I think, relatively easy to spot um, and is extremely powerful and it comes up relatively often. The other actually probably comes up more often but is an absolute nightmare to spot. Um, but it's not, um, it's not a technique we've covered on the channel before and I wanted to just give it a few minutes in this video because I think it's quite interesting. So let's talk firstly about the I suppose the, the slightly simpler technique, um, still an advanced method, uh, but it's it's spotable here if you start to focus on the rows and columns that contain a lot of digits already. And in particular, I'd encourage you to look look hard at row one and row nine. And what we're looking for is is some interesting property about about these rows, something they might share in common. And the key to spotting this actually is this three here. It's three hidden away in the middle of the grid that's preventing this cell here from containing a three. You may say, why on earth does that matter? Well, um, it matters because if we study row one and row nine, you can now see that there is a there is a certain similarity in the positions that threes can go in these two rows. Um, three can go here and here in row one, and it can go here, here, and here in row 9. And this should, hopefully, if you've been watching the videos that we publish uh, regularly on Cracking the Cryptic, put you in mind of a particular technique. A technique is called a finned X-Wing and it's an extension on the basic X-Wing principle. Just to remind you, and those who are new to the channel, what that means. Well, let's, let's firstly analyze this position as if this could not be a 3 here. You can now see there's two positions exactly in rows 1 and rows 9 where a 3 can go. And as, as so often, let's just let's just analyze the consequences. Let's pick one of them. Let's say this could be a 3. If this is a 3, this can't be a 3. This can't be a 3. So the only other place a 3 could go in row 9 is here. And we'd have this arrangement of 3s in the grid. And it should now be clear that if we look at columns 1 and columns 9, there can be no more threes. It's impossible to place another three anywhere in the column here or here because this pattern will eliminate those threes. So now let's imagine what happens. I'm going to do this carefully. Sometimes the software plays up a bit. There we go. So let's use the alternative arrangement. Let's say that rather than three being here in row one, it's over here. It's a three is over here. This must be a three we can't have a 3 here and we know there's only two positions a 3 can appear in row 9. It can't be here, it's got to be over here. And here again, the, the, the logical inference of this arrangement of 3s would be that there can't be any 3s down columns 1 and 9 again. So uh, in particular if we look at this square for example, if we ask ourselves what numbers can go, go in this square, you can see we've got 1, 2, 6 and 8 in the row. We need to place 3, 4, 5 uh, 7 and 9, where we've got 3, 4, 5, 7, 
um, a nine in the column already. So if, if we were able to find a simple x-wing here, we could eliminate this three, and this would be a nine on its own, and we could write the nine in large, nu large numbers. So that's the basic x-wing. It's called an x-wing because it sort of makes this x pattern, if you imagine it like this. Now the finned x-wing is just a little extension of that logic. So now we can see I've added the three here. And the simple question to ask is, OK, what are the two scenarios that could be true? Well, either this is true, i.e. this is not a three, and we'll have an x-wing. And we know if there's an x-wing, I can eliminate the three as a candidate in this cell and give myself the nine. So that's one possibility. The other possibility is that this is, in fact, a three. Well, if this is a three, I can still eliminate this three. Um, so this, this cell here is called the fin of the x-wing. And because this cell here can see both the x-wing and the fin of the x-wing, we're able to basically use the logic that I just described to eliminate the three as a candidate. That would give us a nine here, and the solve could proceed. Now, that's one way making progress at this point in the solve. Now the other way I want to talk about uh, is something called an almost, almost locked set. Now what is an almost locked set? Well, uh, let's I'll just fill in a couple of numbers to show you. So hopefully on the screen now you can see I filled in some candidates in a few of the cells that didn't have candidates in them already. And I want to just let's focus on these two squares firstly. You can see we have a 3-5 combination in this one as the only possibles and a 5-7 combination here as the only possible. So what we have here is two cells with exactly three unknowns. Yeah, And so if, if on the other hand rather than this being a 7 this had been a 3 we would have two cells, two unknowns and this would be called a locked set. Here we have to not quite as good. We've got three five and a five seven. So we've got one unknown too many for these two cells, if you like. We can't quite claim that these these two cells are locked. Now, the interesting thing about the almost locked sets rule is that sometimes this sort of arrangement matches up with another almost locked set in another row or column that can sort of see this one. So let's have a look now at row 9 instead. And you can see here, again hopefully I've added the highlighting, we've got this cell and this cell where we've got, again, we've got two cells and three unknowns. Um, so we've got two, three and seven rather than ideally just, for example, the two seven. So we've almost got a lock set here, again, but not quite. But the interesting thing about these two almost lock sets is that they share a common digit. And that common digit can see the other locked set in this 3x3 three three block. You could say this 3x3 three three block, or actually you could say column 4. Matters little. You can see, so a way of stating this, I suppose, that might be slightly simpler to understand is that a 7 can only appear in one of these almost locked sets. If the 7 was in this one, in row 8, it couldn't also appear in this one, this 2, 7, 2, 3 combination. Now, this actually allows us to use some quite interesting logic, because if there is another unknown in the almost locked sets that is common, and here you can see the number three is appearing in both of these almost locked sets. It's nowhere near, these, these number threes here are nowhere near each other in the grid, but they are common to the almost locked sets that we're interested in. Then an interesting thing happens when we start to ask ourselves questions about the sevens. So let's think first, what happens if this is the 7 here. If this is the 7, we know there cannot be 
a 7 in this almost locked set, which will give us a locked set in row 9. We will now have a 2, a, a two in this cell and a 2, 3 here. So we've now got two cells and exactly two unknowns. So we will be able to write a 2 in here and a 3 here. Let me do that just to illustrate what would happen. So this is this is the 7. We would have a 2 here and a 3 here. Okay. Now let's, I'm really hoping this doesn't mess up. No, it didn't, good. Let's ask ourselves the question now, okay, well what happens if the other thing is true? So if this is the 7, what happens if this is the 7 instead? Now if this is the 7 instead, we now manage to create a locked set on these two numbers. Because this can't be a 7, we now have a 5 as the only possible here, and a 3, 5 as the only possibles here. So again, we've now got two candidates for two unknowns. This would have to be a 5, and this would have to be a 3. Now you may have noticed something interesting about the 3s now. So either way round, a 3 appeared. Either the 3 is here, or the 3 is down here. One of those things must be true. Now what does that mean? That means that any cell in this Sudoku that can see both this cell and this cell cannot contain a 3. So now ask yourself the question, well which cells, which cells does this, does this apply to? And there are a few cells that, that this applies to. Uh, one of them is obviously this cell here, which we were looking at before. So we would be able to eliminate the 3 from here and give ourselves the 9 using the almost lock sets method rather than the bin x wing method. The other cell, I suppose, is this one. We would be able to eliminate the 3 here because this cell and this cell can both see this cell here. And that would give us a naked 4 here. Um, the other cell, I guess, would be this one. This cell can also see this one and this one, so we'll be able to eliminate the 3 here and get the 4, 7 as the two possibles for this cell. Um, so, quite an interesting technique. Not at all easy to spot. Now, the reason it's spottable here is because... Let me just try and delete some numbers now just to get us back to this position, is I often recommend with these diabolical puzzles that it's it's worthwhile, once you get stuck, listing all of the cells that only can contain two digits. So you can see, if we look at this one, this one, this one, these all pop up when you do this. Now, almost lock sets with a number in common are, I find anyway, very hard to see. But here, there is a little chance to do it because they are actually next to each other. These two cells that can contain the two unknowns here are very obviously next to each other. And therefore, there is a chance here to spot this almost lock sets pattern. And it, it comes up an awful lot. Um, the difficult thing about it is noticing it. Um, here, as I say, there is the opportunity. Well done if you did spot it. Uh, during your solve of the puzzle. Um, please leave feedback and enjoy the video. Um, but thanks for watching. If you enjoy the content, please subscribe to the channel. We really appreciate that. We'll be back soon with another edition of Cracking the Cryptic.